Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 5, Radical is the New Sensible, with guest Rivera Sun. Rivera Sun is a changemaker, a cultural creative, a protest novelist, and an advocate for nonviolence and social justice. She is the author of many novels, including The Dandelion Insurrection and The Way Between. She is also the editor of Nonviolence News, a free weekly newsletter. I first discovered Rivera's writings on Counterpunch, and began following her on social media. A couple years back, when I asked her if I could mail her a copy of my most recent book, The Failures of Farming and the Necessity of Wild Tending, she graciously offered to send me one of her own books. I chose The Dandelion Insurrection, and once I picked it up, I couldn't put it down and spent the whole day reading it. I will admit that in the past, I have been skeptical of nonviolence as an approach or dogma. This dates back to my time in Portland, Oregon, in the early 2000s, when the big protests against the upcoming Iraq War were going on. There, some of the prominent nonviolence activists I knew struck me as close-minded, uptight, and unrealistic. Disagreements often came up as to whether property destruction constituted violence, which I felt tended to fetishize property, and by extension, to shield class and capital from criticism. Additionally, some nonviolent proponents tended to conflate violence and illegality, as if Gandhi and King and others had not purposefully engaged in illegal actions. The most frustrating moment came for me when some of the folks from that crowd got upset that people were using chalk on sidewalks and walls to express anti-war messages. In Portland, chalking is not even illegal. This I knew for certain from the local lawyer who provided letters to chalk activists that they could show to the police if challenged. And chalking is not destructive. In rainy Oregon, it'll soon be gone. That was a breaking point for me, and I pretty much ignored the nonviolent crowd after that for years to come. But when I started getting into Rivera Sun's work, I came to understand that nonviolence does not at all have to be about prissiness or passivity. To the contrary, it can be loud, bold, active, engaging, and quite effective. I found myself re-inspired, which is always gratifying. I interviewed Rivera on March 11th, 2020, and we covered a lot of ground, including methodology, media, organizing, technology, and using fiction to spread messages. She is a dedicated activist, and it was a real pleasure to talk with her. Hello, Rivera. Thank you for joining me on my show today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on. I wanted to start off with uh, the basics today. Just imagining for a moment that part of the audience that will be listening to this is an audience which is not very politically astute uh, or educated or experienced. How is it that you would go about defining nonviolence as an approach? Well, I think nonviolence is actually something that we freak out about when we hear the word, but actually we know quite intimately from our day-to-day experiences. Nonviolence is a very large and broad word that describes most of what we do in the world, honestly. If most of what we did was violence, we simply wouldn't be here. So uh, but proportionately, what we, what we do is nonviolence. And it includes everything that's very familiar, such as constructive programs and alternative institutions. Those are things like restorative justice programs or um, farming uh, local food programs or soup kitchens could even be a, a form of nonviolence in that way. Uh, Nonviolence is really any response to a problem or a uh, a challenge in your community that uses uh, answers and solutions that do not cause harm to people or to the environment. So 
this could also include things that are types of actions, some of which are very familiar to us, such as strikes or boycotts, protests, demonstrations, and some of which are not as familiar to us that are a little bit more unusual. Occupations, blockades, uh, call-in six, walkouts, uh, sit-in strikes, the, and then the list goes on. There's actually over 300 different methods of nonviolent action. And they're usually used in pairings to achieve specific goals that the people organizing with them uh, want to achieve in their community, society, or world. Right. Well, so it, it's quite a it, it's quite a, a broad category of, of actions. Then, mm -hmm. yes, right. it's one of its superpowers is it has so much versatility. So, in the in the in in recent uh, U.S. history, recent meaning just say the last generation or so, uh, are there a couple of examples that you could bring up for people that are that are well known that they would have would have heard of and seen and been saying, look, there's a case of of how nonviolence was was used. Mm -hmm, sure. Well, right now, one of the the most successful areas, or the most, let's start with the most active areas of nonviolent action, is actually around climate change. And I know that's a controversial for many, a controversial subject for many Americans. But in terms of what's going on in the movements, we're seeing increasing numbers of people joining in with things like the student climate strikes, the divestment campaigns to get. Uh, institutions to divest from fossil fuels, uh, Extinction Rebellion, and a slew of other groups in the U.S. that have been stopping pipelines or stalling uh, fracking projects for decades now. And so where we're seeing the most success in those areas is actually in the divestment. So uh, banks, institutions like colleges and universities, uh, retirement funds are withdrawing their uh, money from the from funding fossil fuel development projects and this is having a direct impact on the industry and slowing the rate of growth of the fossil fuel industry which is a very important step to reining in climate the climate crisis right so so the target so to speak of a nonviolent campaign and is going to be different depending on what the campaign is in some cases it's going to be what, say, a political leader, or in some cases, mm -hmm. it's going to be a corporation, in some cases, other other entities? Absolutely. So there is no one-size-fits-all campaign for the myriad different social justice issues that we face. Each campaign needs to identify their goals. What do they want to change in the world? And then who are the people or organizations that can enact that change? Usually, not always, but usually those are your targets of your campaign. Um, you have some rare examples where you're, you have power or traditional power holders, but you're actually trying to change the hearts and minds of a group of people or you're trying to make a cultural shift before you're even working on a policy shift. So uh, that there's some nuances in there, but in general, yes. So if you're workers who want better wages, you're you're usually aiming your campaign at management uh, or owners of your company. And oftentimes, with workers, we'll see them go on strike. We'll see them do a variety of creative protests or lightning strikes or flash walkouts. Not all workers actually have the ability to organize in their workplace. Uh, some of them are constrained by both law or union um, decision-making policies. So sometimes we see some very creative types of actions that circumnavigate the, the more typical types of actions they might use. It sounds like then that looking back over the history of social justice just in the United States, for example, it, it's striking me now the way you're talking about this, that most movements perhaps have been predominantly nonviolent in their approach. Yes, this is actually one of the interesting little tidbits of uh, not just U.S. history, but global history, um, which is that we tend to think of change coming uh, at the barrel of a gun, right? Or that violence is going to get us what we want. But when we look at social justice causes, actually nonviolent action has the bulk of that history under its belt. This certainly was true for the U.S. suffragette movement. It was uh, true for the civil rights movement, for the environmental justice movement. Uh, it's been true for labor uh, struggles, uh, both the early labor movement and later waves of it. Uh, it's 
certainly is true for the LGBTQ community in overwhelming numbers of actions. Uh, although, you know, our our violent side of history tends to get a lot of playtime in how we uh, air those stories, let's say. And so everyone knows about the Stonewall riots, which were a watershed moment for LGBTQ struggles. But we tend to ignore, when we're doing historical retellings of how we got from here to there, the enormous amounts of nonviolent actions that also happened and continue to happen. Another very successful campaign uh, was the disability rights struggle for the ADA. Very, very powerful nonviolent campaign and one that we don't often tell the story of. I hadn't I hadn't thought of that as, as being an example. I know that um, Senator then Senator Bob Dole had a part in uh, passing that legislation in part because of his own disability. But I, I guess I had missed that there, there was also a movement that was pushing that from below. Mm -hmm. Yes, they did a number of actions. One of the most uh, uh, well-known actions was what was called the Capitol Crawl, in which um, people who were in wheelchairs flung themselves out of their wheelchairs and literally dragged themselves up the steps of the Capitol, the U.S. Capitol building, which at that time had no ADA access. Uh, this incredibly evocative image of people trying to get access to the type of political system that we tend to take a lot of pride in um, really s swept the news media at the time and really put the burden of moral responsibility and ethics onto those congresspersons to see that the lack of this, this law was creating unjust and unequal situations for Americans with, uh, who were differently abled. That's quite a striking image. Well, I guess this has really been one of the tools since at least the 60s has been to try to get media attention of a particular image. I mean, we all know that the, the fire hoses being turned on the protesters in the South in the 60s had a big part in helping to turn opinion against the segregationists of the South and helped to uh, push the federal government to send their own forces to the South to try to bring order back to the situation. So, so the I guess trying to take advantage of the spectacle has been a part of this this fight too in recent years. I think with the media, we need to be a little careful. Uh, they have played very important roles in uh, popularizing and polarizing around social justice issues, but getting a lot of media attention is not the primary goal of a campaign. It is actually uh, quite a, a dangerous thing uh, to seek exclusively. We don't win struggles simply in the hearts and the minds of the people. We have to also win our struggles uh, by precipitating a change in human behaviors. And so while it's important to do excellent media work, it's also not quite as important as finding with a, w uh, ways to withdraw tangible support from the power holders in exchange for demand. For example, it's not enough for workers to do a series of press releases about how bad their working conditions are. They also need to organize a strike or a boycott of the company so that the people are withdrawing either labor or money from the corporation or company um, to ensure that the pressure is put on the traditional power holders to make a change to their policy and pay the workers more. Do you see the distinction there? We often make this mistake about thinking we just have to get enough people aware of the problem and then change will naturally happen. But history has shown us that that is not actually the, the way that change happens. Change happens when we change the dynamics of the playing field and uh, kind of put some pressure on uh, the power holders to recognize that the choice they had made before of exploiting workers or denying people their civil or human rights uh, that was probably previously profitable or pleasurable in some way to those individuals is no longer as profitable or pleasurable or easy or convenient, that they now have to make a different choice uh, given the factors that we have changed through our nonviolent actions. I'm really glad that you made that point. I've been involved in a number of campaigns uh, myself over time, especially when I lived in, in Portland. I was involved in the tree-sitting campaigns there. I was also involved in the anti-war movements there. I was also involved in the 
uh, independent media movement there, where one response that we had to this was that we were seeing that for the most part, uh, commercial corporate, you know, mainstream media is they don't have uh, open ears or open minds to the messages of activists in most cases, and they are not usually amenable to bringing those messages across to people anyway. And so we felt like part of what we needed to do as activists was create our own media structure so that we could be telling our own stories without a filter to ourselves and to, to other people and to be getting the word out that way. And so creating a different, different, a different infrastructure independent of the, uh, the, the, the corporate media infrastructure and one thing that I've seen change uh, since this happened, because this was in the early 2000s when I was involved in that, you might have remembered the indie, indie media movement. Uh, one thing I've noticed that's changed since then is that mm -hmm. the internet has become, especially with the rise of social media, the internet has sort of become more under corporate control than it was uh, 20 years ago. There are the main channels that people are using now for communicating and sharing news you know, the social media outlets, you know, are definitely corporate controlled and are not, they're not really built for helping out activists. They're built for making a profit. And so for that reason, they seem to have a very mm -hmm. limited role in being able to help us. No, I agree with a lot of your analysis. I, I have done a lot of social media work over the years and I have watched the algorithms, particularly on Facebook, but also on Twitter, uh, become more and more constrained in their uh, what they call organic reach. But basically, it, it's become more of a pay to play platform that if you pay for advertisement, they open up your your reach, right? Right. And this has serious consequences in for a set of movements that are often trying to unravel the very problems that capitalism and consumerism and the over uh, privileging of money and wealth uh, have created in our world. So uh, I do think it is, is a problem. I do think social media still has a very powerful role in our lives. I think it's harder for us as ordinary citizens to um, achieve the goals we might want to have on those platforms now. Um, but I do think in terms of a, a still public arena in which we daily interact with people and exchange uh, opinions and ideas, there's still a lot going on on those platforms that should not be ignored or overlooked. I just think it's the days of imagining we could just start a Facebook event and suddenly millions of people will take it, take to the streets. Those are, those are over and done if they existed ever at all. And I do agree that it is vitally important for movements to actually build their own media. Uh, people don't know this about Gandhi, but Gandhi actually ran the world's largest circulation newspaper. Really? The Young India. Yes. Isn't that an amazing piece of information that we don't learn? I had no idea. Right. So, um, also, I think, you know, there's a, a well-known struggle of the newspaper boys in New York in the turn of the century. And one of the things they had to do in the course of their campaign of trying to fight the uh, probably equally as controlled media of their day as a Pulitzer, Pulitzer and Hearst uh, was to actually create their own broadsheet, you know, to actually do their own printing. Uh, they tried to work with relatively independent media. They got cut out of that process. Um, so, you know, we do see this over and over again, that uh, controlling our con communications and finding ways to circumvent the platforms on which we're constrained is crucial. It's crucial to almost every struggle. You'll see an element of that. Uh, all over the place if you look carefully at historic and present case studies. Right, right, definitely. We, so far, we're, when speaking about media, we've been talking about the uh, news, but there's also the entertainment media, which I, you know, probably has a, a much greater viewership and, and a, a greater influence maybe on people. And I think that a lot of times, and I, I think you've pointed this out as well, that in a lot of movies, TV shows, and other entertainment media, violence is often portrayed 
as acceptable or even noble. You know, for、mm-hmm. example, a stock storyline you'll often see is a, a hero whose wife and or children are killed, and so at the beginning of the film or in a flashback, so now he spends. The rest of the movie exacting revenge on his enemies, you know,、uh, killing one after the other, and this is seen as being heroic, you know.、Mm-hmm. Uh, and and so I was wondering if you wanted to say anything about、uh, both negative and positive things that you've seen in in, in entertainment、mm-hmm. media about the, on the subject of nonviolence. Sure, I'm so glad you brought this up because one of the the greatest challenge to successful nonviolent struggles is our own skepticism around them.、Uh, and on one hand, we don't know the track record of nonviolent struggles that、uh, they're in in certain categories of very hard struggles to win, such as overthrowing dictators or expelling foreign invaders or、um, Ending occupations, nonviolence is actually twice as effective as violence in those struggles, which is ironic since those are three of the typical case studies in which we claim we need military defense. But actually, to achieve those goals, nonviolent action is twice as effective as violence. So why do we perpetuate these beliefs? And in part, it's because we have a culture of violence, and the culture trains us through movies, books, televisions, tropes,、uh, political speeches to believe that violence is our best, only, and most morally just solution to our conflicts. But conflict, while inevitable,、uh, it, conflict is inevitable. But violence is actually quite optional. Uh, and in in Hollywood has a very bad problem with this.、Um, people don't really know this, but the Pentagon actually has offices in Hollywood, <laughs> and ostensibly what they're doing is, you know, tracking films like Midway and making sure that the representation of the type of airplanes is correct. But they're also got their their fingers on the Hollywood circuit to convince us to, that、uh, violence is noble, as you say. I mean, if you look at the DC Marvel comics, that's pretty much the the overarching narrative of our extraordinariness and our exceptionalism, and that heroes are these kind of lone mavericks that dare to use violence against dangerous enemies that nobody else can fight. This is a very convenient narrative for our country、uh, and our national goals. Um, but if you look carefully, there's so many other ways to resolve our problems, and our media, our entertainment media, could be an amazing educational、uh, platform. They have so many opportunities to teach other forms of conflict resolution. And to illustrate this point, I want to talk about the film Moana. So, Moana is a Disney cartoon, and it's based on. Indigenous myths in the to the Pacific Islander cultures. In that movie,、uh, the the young girl goes on a great, amazing adventure, and in the very end of the film, the、uh, villain, let's say the the fiery lava monster, is revealed to be not a foe to be defeated with violence, but rather someone who has been wronged and hurt, and the, her heart has been stolen. And the solution to that problem is not chopping off her head as, or sla- putting a, a sword through her heart, as so many of our films might p- depict. The solution is to restore her heart, to return what was broken, to repair the harm that was done by events earlier in the the movie. This is an example of the power that movies and and.、Um, Uh, entertainment media have to teach nonviolent solutions, to teach the reality that we have so many options to resolve our conflicts. And my my personal dream would be to see us doing much much more of this. I think we would live in a safer, more just, and much more creative world than we currently do. Right. Well, I I can think of.、Uh... Of a book that I think would make a great movie、uh, that would help teach some of these things, and that would be the Dandelion Insurrection. <laughs> <laughs> that that's the only book、that's、of、true. yours that I've I've read so far because I have a very small、uh, book budget myself.、Uh, but I really enjoyed that novel. I thought it was really effective, not only as a showcase of different nonviolent techniques. But also just as a story and as a work of fiction, it really did draw me in. From early on, I did care about the characters and was interested in the story and wanted to know what、uh, what was going to happen to them and how they were going to get through it. And I think that in that way, you were able to 
overcome a pitfall that, that other people might, might fall into where, oh, I have a message. How can I tell that through fiction without watering the fiction down too much? Maybe if you don't mind, you could t- talk a little bit about that challenge as a writer to, to bring messages in and yet still be writing good fiction. Yeah, it is a great challenge. Uh, many of us want to write fiction and many of us want to speak about the the causes and the mes- messages that are very uh, important for us uh, all as humans to hear right now. I think uh, in The Dandelion Insurrection and in many of my other works, one of my great challenges as a writer is to communicate those messages in a way that is authentic to human experience. So... Uh, In the Dandelion Instruction, we're focusing on uh, a pair of activists who are trying to change the shape of their country, right? And they're not preaching in the book too much, maybe occasionally, but they're not preaching so much as engaged in the doing of the struggle. And that's compelling. That's always a compelling story. Um, We see this over and over again narrationally, that we get very invested in characters who dare to take a chance to go out on a limb. Uh, and, you know, there's the famous Ayn Randian, uh, 70 or 80 or whatever it is, page rant by John Galt. Um, and that's a great example of what not to do uh, in writing. I mean, I'm not an Ayn Rand fan. I, I feel her books are, her worldview is very, has been very destructive in our world. Yes. And I think that uh, that is something else authors and and entertainers need to pay attention to is what what are the meta narratives that we're putting out there and what what is their effect and impact on the world and can we live with that effect i'm not ayn rand so i make a different call on what what goes into my books but i i tend to lean towards compassion and equality and justice and uh, taking care of one another as major themes in my writing yeah one of the things that i work very hard to do as a writer is what we've been talking about about taking a situation and scenario that we would that we would often tell with a violent narrative and replacing that with an with a nonviolent alternatives in compelling ways that aren't just oh just be nice to everyone and it'll all work out but really grapple with the reality of the challenges that we face in the conflicts that that are in our world my other series uh that's geared to include younger readers in the readership of it. I found that older readers also love it, but I wanted to make sure it was uh, age accessible, uh, is the Ariara series. And this is a, a fantasy st- series. It's an adventure series. And this is a genre that is full of violence. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you look at fantasy, yeah. it is obscene. It's actually bordering on obscene how much violence is an automatic it's an an assumption of the field but i don't take it as automatic i look at it as a fault a flaw that for a genre that is creative enough to invent um magic and dragons and alternative worlds to continue to just assume that violence is the only option is really a failure of imagination so in my novels i posit a uh, fantastical world with a young uh, female heroine who uses uh, nonviolent action and peace-building skills to address the problems in a world, including stopping the wars that are being brewed up by the the various noble factions, uh, solving injustices of of economic inequalities, uh, waging struggle for women's rights. These are the possibilities that exist when we start to challenge old tropes and start to educate ourselves with the very tools that people around the world are using to ad- use the, to address these problems. Because that's the other hidden piece of information is that uh, by and large, human beings are using far more nonviolent action than violent action in trying to resolve things like women's rights and environmental issues and um, economic inequalities. So I, I think there's a hidden story going on in our world. And I think as authors and creatives, we have a responsibility to find out what that hidden story is and to put it into these myths and these uh, epic stories that we're trying to create for our times. Right. And it seems like uh, you're you're meeting with some success with that. I, I see you post sometimes that uh, your books are being used in, in different classroom situations. I believe you also have... 
uh, workbooks that go along with some of your, your books for groups to work together with the concepts as well? Yes. So I'm very happy that uh, the the RERA series has been very well received by teachers and students, uh, by peace activists and by um, parents and people who work a lot with kids in uh, outside of school settings and that they are, you know, picking up stacks of books to read with the young people and to open these very conversations that are, are similar to what we've been having today. Uh, I think it's it's very hopeful for our world. Um, I also do think that a good story has embedded in it the opportunity to discuss the things that matter to us in, in our lives. And this is why things like The Lord of the Rings actually have an enduring quality for us, is that the archetypes are still very relatable in our modern world, and they teach us things. It's just a question of how, how what can we teach about conflict and about uh, the need for violence or the lack of need for violence. So, uh, yes, I, I think my books are getting out there. They're doing the work they're designed to do. Um, they're showing that heroes ca- don't always have to pick up a sword or a gun to be heroic and that uh, we we do have some amazing superpowers as human beings that if we all knew more about them, we could all be using in our world. That's a really lovely outlook, and I appreciate uh, that you, you bring that to so much of your work. In a state of shock after the war, we interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... We live in times that seem very hopeless, I think, for for many people, or uh, people seem often feel overwhelmed by all the negative things that seem to be going on. And so bringing a different uh, a spirit uh, of that uh, as you are through your work, I think is really commendable. And I think it's, it's, it's helpful in a, in, a, in a solid way. And you've, uh, you've reinvigorated an interest in nonviolence in uh, me as I've, as I've read through your stuff. But a question on the, on the subject of students, uh, one reason why it's, it's so good that your work is coming into the schools is because the schools are also being influenced, especially as we get older up to high school age, by military recruitment. I know that uh, you've been uh, involved with those kinds of campaigns, too. Could we talk a little bit about that? The, the, the Pentagon's, um, their attempts mm-hmm. to recruit right out of school. Yeah, uh, I don't do as much work in counter recruitment, but I do follow the people who are doing a lot of work in that area. Lately, I've been working on an effort to abolish the U.S. military draft for all genders. There's a question about whether or not it will be expanded to women, which is objectionable for many reasons. But it's the reasons that are valid, in my opinion, are the same reasons we don't want men to be drafted into the military uh, but one of the pro- the challenges that we face in our culture of violence here in the United States is the prevalence of the the military recruiters in our schools and the problem of what's called the poverty draft that people young people are signing up to join the military because they're facing some real lack of options and opportunities in a world where college is not affordable and accessible for all people. Um, where our schools are, are suffering from gross inequalities in what is what schools get funding, what schools don't, uh, that we're we're not adequately uh, responding to the real needs of our young people in terms of uh, social supports and, and challenges that they're facing. And so for many, the military is a way to get out of, of the problems they're facing. But of course, it creates problems. Uh, we have incredibly high rates of veteran suicides. We've had more deaths from suicide than we've had from uh, from combat. We have major problems with PTSD, which is now being known as not a, um, it's not a fluke. PTSD is not something that happens uh, to some soldiers because of some situ- horrible, horrible situations. PTSD is what happens to human beings who experience violence and trauma. So um, these are the real concerns that are not told by military recruiters. Uh, but of course, our, our military budget is 
obscenely enormous. <laughs> our military budget is over half of our discretionary budget. And this is completely nonsensical. It's completely ridiculous. We are pouring money into the military, money that could be better spent uh, by promoting peace and opportunity is for both our own, our own people, but also throughout the world. Justice is an amazing cost-effective measure. It's also an amazing uh, way to invest in the well-being of a whole populace rather than trying to dominate and control with violence. Yeah, and the topic of, of you know U.S. imperialism and militarism, obviously, uh, that's the cause of so much conflict around the world. And if we really did want to uh, be friends with uh, with with people uh, in the rest of the world and cooperate, the, a good first step would be to close our eight hundred plus military bases around the world <laughs> and 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 bring, bring our troops home. I mean, you know, we know from specific situations like Okinawa that they just don't want us there, you know, anymore. Right. Yeah, I, I would like to also talk about the connections between violence, militarism, and the different ecological crises mm -hmm. that we're facing right now, because there's definitely a straight line between the two of them. Absolutely. <laughs> I think when we look around at the problems our world face, we'll find that they are all very entwined and interconnected, not just in their current manifestations, but also in the history and the timeline that led up to this moment. Uh, one piece of nonviolent history that I often uh, and increasingly get to speak about at colleges and universities or in public talks or online forums is the nonviolent history of American independence. And this is a, a little known piece of history about the decade that preceded the Declaration of Independence. Most usually our narrative of our founding um, uh, myth goes something like, the Declaration of Independence was issued, and we went to war with Great Britain, and we won our freedom. Uh, this is actually completely, it's not complete nonsense, it happened, but a decade pri in the decade prior to the Declaration of Independence, we actually had some of the world's most robust and effective nonviolent campaigns, including parallel institutions such as the Continental Congress, uh, including the world's most successful boycotts. We had a spinning campaign 150 years before Gandhi appeared on the scene using the same tactic against the same British Empire. I could go on and on about these stories, but the point that I'm trying to illustrate is that we have an amazing history of nonviolent action in this, this country that is covered up, concealed, ignored, forgotten. And there's a reason for that, because the alternative story promotes war and violence and militarism and imperialism. And this uh, has been part of how we expanded uh, our continental foothold uh, through wars of genocide against the Native Americans. It's how we built up our military and uh, have come to be a militaristic superpower throughout the world. And it also is how we've uh, maintained with violence the ability and the capacity to wreak havoc on our natural world. And we're finding that the planet Earth cannot sustain this ideology anymore. It cannot sustain the idea that we're going to use increasing amounts of violence to continue to use fossil fuels, which then uh, create climate instability. So we're really at a crossroads and on the, all these interconnected issues. And we in the United States play a very big po part in deciding that if we're going to change our culture and change ourselves, if we're going to go a different direction, if we're going to demilitarize and work for peace, and if we're going to reallocate the immense amount of human resources, money, time, intelligence, skill, um, inventiveness from military pursuits and domination through violence into the, the kinds of skills and practices and new economies that we need to guarantee humanity's place on planet Earth. And this is a major existential crisis in every single way that we can possibly imagine. And my thesis is that we as a people in the U.S. Uh, have a choice about which side of our DNA uh, for our country we're going to uh, embody. We have one side of our history that is incredibly violent and incredibly un unjust. And we have another side of our history that has unrelentingly persisted in pursuing justice and the bulk of those struggles have used nonviolent action 
And I say, this is the piece of our history and our identity that is worthy and worthy of uh, embodying and articulating and understanding and applying again, yet again in these times. Well, that's certainly an inspiring uh, way to, to look at, it, and I appreciate that. I, I feel as though one way to look at history is to see that uh, there's been different streams that have been flowing the whole time, and there's been streams of resistance to oppression and to domination that have been continuing uninterrupted the entire time that there's ever been oppression and domination. That is, there's never been a culture based on violence or oppression that did not also have a resistance to it. And so mm -hmm. in that sense, those of us who are trying to work on these issues today can look to the past for solidarity, you know, not just for inspiration, but for solidarity and to know, oh, we are not alone, uh, even if we might feel like there's not many of us around now. We are not alone and that we are part of this tradition and this unbroken line, you know. I, I agree that the situation we're in right now is, is, is quite dire as, as well and that, and that mm -hmm. action will need to be taken soon. I think there's a lot of people who see this. There are people who look at that and who would then claim that uh, human nature is inherently violent or inherently greedy or domineering. They'll point to different historical factors. They'll say we're like, you know, bacteria or whatever. And they'll say that this is just our nature to be this way as humans. I, I don't think you you agree with that, but I'm hoping you can you can speak to that. Mm -hmm. I, I have heard that argument. Um, I think it's strangely, it's comfortable for people. It allows us to persist in the, the present state without doing anything or it allows us to accept death or extinction without making a heroic and incredible effort to engage the, the part of humanity that has always existed, our capacity to change and transform. At a very fundamental level, I disagree with the thesis. I, I do not think the archaeological record confirms that human beings have always been violent. I think the archaeological record actually confirms that we have had uh, a relatively short amount of time as human beings with active uh, violence and warfare. So I, I think that's something people should check out. I think they should really challenge that notion on an archaeological basis. I think also on a um, sociological basis, we should look around and notice what I said at the very beginning of this call, that most of our actions day in and day out are rooted in nonviolence. This is not actually rocket science, that it must be this way. If our actions day in and day out were violent, we would very rapidly and swiftly cease to exist. The proof is in the pudding in terms of warfare. We see how quickly we collapse our civilizations when war is present. Um, and so we have to use a little common sense and remember that most of what we're using is nonviolence. So what do we do about the piece of us right now that continues to perpetuate violence? Well, I think we need to look and see at how the culture of violence actually is begetting violence in our world, making it seem normal and natural, making it seem like our only response and actually creating a void of, of ignorance or lack of knowledge about other uh, examples and, you know, if people want to experiment with this, I would invite them to engage with active bystander classes, um, trainings for peace teams, violence de-escalation and interrupting uh, trainings. These things exist. And I know for me, a watershed moment in my commitment to nonviolence came when I got these kind of trainings, when I realized that as a five foot five, uh, 120 pound lightweight, uh, you know, winning a, a bout of violence against larger, stronger, bigger opponents with more training and many different kinds of violence uh, is not a very good bet. It's not a very good scenario. So I try to train in all these other skills. And what I've learned is that our capacity to de escalate violent conflict is incredible. Our capacity to choose a different path is unbelievable. And what we're finding around the world is that organized nonviolent action is so much more powerful, versatile, and accessible to everyday human beings from 
myself to you to um, kids like the kids who are walking out of school today um, for the climate strikes uh, to your grandmother I often say in trainings where people are, you know, sitting, listening to me go on and on like this, like to look around. Not all of us would be able to get up and go to war for a violent conflict, but every single one of us is capable of doing a sit and strike. We have, we're doing it right now. So I think nonviolence is actually the predominant human capacity. I think we have a lot of violence in our world, but I don't think it's inherent to human experience. And I think we can skill up the aspects of ourselves that are able to replace uh, what we're using violence for with other forms of addressing conflict. So uh, I believe in human potential. I believe in our capacity and I don't accept lazy thinking, uh, convenient or comfortable thinking when it comes to violence. And I do call it out as, you know, it's actually fairly comfortable for us when we're immersed in a culture of violence to believe in it. But, it's uncomfortable to challenge those notions and those assumptions and to say, maybe there's something else. Maybe there's something different. And from my vantage point, with the, all the knowledge that I've gained and learned and study, I know there's something different. And it's not only different, it's better. It's more effective. It's more versatile. It's more useful. It's right now changing our entire world from top to bottom. And uh, you should keep an eye on it. It's pretty powerful stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And one way of uh, keeping an eye on that that I've been appreciating lately is the uh, newsletter that you send out. Uh, it seems like it's once a week. Um, mm-hmm. uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about that uh, here. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for bringing up nonviolence news. Uh, I can't believe I forgot to mention it before now. But one of the places that I get my uh, enduring faith in nonviolence is actually by following the week in and week out stories of people who are using uh, nonviolent struggle around the world. Uh, I collect 30 to 50 stories every single week, and I actually have to rein myself in. I could probably collect 60 to 80 stories, but then the newsletter gets incredibly long and nobody reads it. So uh, what what I see is that nonviolent action is being used far more often than anyone, even people who teach this stuff like I do, suspect. Um, it's happening in large scale uh, examples, all the way down to small scale examples. For uh, in the same week, I might share a story about how Sudan overthrew its dictator using a woman-led nonviolent struggle, and a story about how parents went out in front of a school in California to hold up signs to say "Stop bullying" uh, because their school has a problem in bullying. So, uh, what we see is that nonviolent struggle is happening for almost every issue under the sun and week after week after week, these stories roll in. So uh, nonviolence news can be found at nonviolencenews.org. You can sign up for the newsletter. It's free uh, and it's quite heartening. It's a, it's a really wonderful lens to watch global news and local news through because you see not only the issues that we're, we're struggling against, but what people like us are doing about them. And that is incredibly heartening. Yeah, I, you know, I signed up for it a couple of months back and have been astounded from the beginning. Each time it comes in, I'm like, wow, I had no idea that all these things were going on. Obviously, a lot of the stories that you're reporting are simply not stories that the corporate media tends to report in general, you know, but then mm-hmm. also that you're that you're collecting them under the rubric of nonviolence and presenting them that way just shows how nonviolence is not about uh, passivity, as I think some people might assume that it is, but mm-hmm. rather is about a very active uh, approach, an, an active and I would say often a very uh, loving approach, even if it is an approach that sometimes involves uh, um, anger. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting one about uh, love and anger. Uh, people are rightfully angry at the suffering that their their communities and their friends and families are facing. Uh, the things that we're up against should make an ordinary human being quite angry. Uh, it's just a question of how you harness that anger and how you funnel it uh, into the work that you're doing. And ironically, we, we all know this lesson from violent conflict. And this is how you know you're in a culture of violence is that I mean, how many movies have we seen from the Karate Kid to 
um, Marvel comics where the hero's journey includes mastering their anger so that they're clear headed in their, their violent battle. Right. This is not unknown, but the idea that we should also have this capacity in nonviolent struggle still seems to baffle people. And that personally baffles me. So Dr. King has a wonderful quote that I'm not remembering about uh, nonviolence is uh, harnessing your anger for maximum effectiveness, something to that effect. And I, I really feel that like anger is a tool, it's a fuel, but un, uh, just if our anger is driving us to lose our head, then we're probably going to lose our struggle, right? So it's okay to feel anger. It's very natural. But what we do with it is really the question. And so for me... Uh, using strategic campaigns, not just one-up actions, but use, and using sets of uh, types of nonviolent action that can really achieve the goals that you're trying to achieve uh, is very important. Oftentimes when we're angry, we just take to the streets and protest, and that might be the release we need. That might be a really important step, but it probably isn't going to be enough to achieve our social justice goal. So we need to keep Keep going, keep thinking, keep strategizing, and and find out how to withdraw our cooperation and consent from the problems and the systems that we face. Right, right. I I, I like that point that you just made about actions versus campaigns. I think that one thing that is not appreciated as much as it, as it once was is the need for organizing. You know, mm-hmm. like uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Cindy Sheehan, who um, is an anti-war activist and who uh, is one of the founders of um, the Women's March on the on the Pentagon. And she was uh, talking about how they were having some trouble with social media, not always showing their posts and this and that, you know. And she brought up the point of like, well, you know, in the 60s, uh, when they were getting a million people out to D.C., they were doing that with flyers, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? And, 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 and phone trees and like church bulletins and this and that. It, they didn't have any of this technology at all and that, that they were able to, to do that. But all that being an example of organizing, of mm-hmm. activism, not being a sprint, but of being a marathon, to, to use the cliché. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, that's something I teach a lot as a trainer in nonviolent struggle. I specialize in teaching strategy. Uh, and so this is something we we often don't realize is that it takes more than a one-time protest. And it takes far more than just protests in general. It takes a, a using types of action that will withdraw your cooperation and your consent or it will obstruct the uh, the problem from continuing on its deadly path, things like uh, blockades or um, occupations can sometimes do that as well. And I think the point that Cindy made about organizing is very, very keen. It's very important in today's era that you can't just put out a call to action and hope people show up. You need to go talk to them. You need to go ask them, request them to to come with you, uh, to go uh, talk with people who are really not wanting to come uh, for whatever reason, or to redesign your strategy to make it more accessible to the people you hope will show up. That's something we also have a challenge with in the United States is that not all of our actions are terribly accessible to the people who want to be taking action for a cause. And so we need to make sure that we're looking at that nonviolent toolbox of over 300 different types of action. And we're, we're finding things that are both effective strategically and accessible for uh, the, the people we'd like to see moving into action. Right, definitely. I think we're, we're getting near the end of our time together here, but I wanted to ask one more question. We're, we're in an election year, as, uh, as you might have noticed. <laughs> and, what? Um, <laughs> right. Yes, I've noticed. <laughs> right. And without getting into any particular candidate or candidates or why they might be a good one or a bad one or et cetera like that, I, 
How, how is it that you see the situation with how so much energy gets pulled into the electoral struggle? I guess I look at it, and I, I feel like too much energy goes into the electoral <laughs> struggle and not enough into other areas and that we become distracted in these years and that to some degree what we're doing is disempowering ourselves by doing that. Do you, do you agree with that assessment at all? Or? Yeah, in many ways. I think we have um, a very challenging problem in the United States. We have many challenging problems. Uh, but during election years, we have to both, uh, we can't give up our organizing work. We have to continue it because the day after the election happens, we're going to need it. <laughs> we need it in the interim too. Uh, but on top of that, in our electoral system, uh, we have some gross injustices happening within the parties uh, within what candidates get featured, um, and right. if you are, uh, if you perceive that this electoral representative republic um, needs to be functional in some capacity at all, uh, then you're going to have to wage a struggle within your political party to hold it accountable yep. to being respectful, to being um, within a legitimate range of sanity. Uh, to being a, f a fair and accessible system for people who are not billionaires um, or extremists. Right. Um, we need to deal with the fact that the media is has been, I mean, the corporate media has been grossly misrepresenting the truth yep. on this issue and many others. And so the media is another area of campaigning that we cannot ignore because the mass media is mass. That's why so much of our energy gets sucked into it is that so much of the cultural programming turned out in these years is designed to suck us into uh, obsessing over this so that we have to drop our organizing work in other ways. So it's a tough challenge. It really is. Um, I uh, struggle during election years. I, uh, Being a social radical, I rarely feel that the way that we do our political elections has much semblance to justice, justice, fairness, and equality, things that we hold dearly as values. Um, and I think that one reason I teach nonviolent action and I write about nonviolent action in my books and I collect the stories in nonviolence news is because this is a perennially available form of people power, political power, social power, it is a way that we uh, become the fourth system of check and balance. It is the way that we make that often quoted will of the people tangible in our political system and our social, cultural, economic, and so forth systems. Uh, so I, I never give up on nonviolent struggle. I think that it actually should be codified into a second bill of rights. I think it is the right and the responsibility and the duty of our citizenry to know this stuff and to use it when appropriate. Uh, I think it's part of our founding mythology and we're going to have to revive that uh, piece of our history in order to navigate the times that we're in. That's great. I totally agree. Thank you. So like, could you tell, um, tell our listeners where to find you and your work uh, online? Absolutely. So my books and novels and uh, many of my essays can be found at riverasun.com. You can also find my books on all major online bookstores. You can find you have your library uh, order them. Uh, your local bookstores can special order them. They're pretty accessible. Uh, Nonviolence News is at nonviolencenews.org. And um, if people want to ask me to come and do trainings with their groups, uh, I'm, I'm very available for that. You can send me a message through my website and uh, we'll connect. That's great. Thank you so much for joining me, Rivera, today. I really appreciate your time and I really enjoyed hearing everything you had to say today. Well, thank you so much for doing this podcast series and for opening up these conversations and being part of the kind of media that we actually really do need in the world. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. 
commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit RadioFreeSunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.